Hello and welcome back to Journeyman, the show where we take you through the footballing world, trying to find those stories that really matter the most. Now, yes, it's grey, it's dark, it's windy, it's gloomy, but it's very apt for the story we're about to tell. Michael, where are we? Yes, we are in Bury, a town which had its heart ripped out earlier this year after its club was expelled from the Football League. Now, we're here to see what life after Bury Football Club means and how the community have responded to such a tragedy. Let's go. So why does football mean so much to Bury? A town on the outskirts of Greater Manchester, Bury was at the heart of the Industrial Revolution and since has gained international fame for both its market and world famous black pudding. So we're here at Diggle's Cafe in Bury Market. Now this place is, is definitely something. We've seen sofas, we've seen cafes, we've seen old retro video games, we've seen hairdressers, we've seen nail salons, absolutely everything. But what it's really famous for, what Berry is really famous for, is black pudding. Now, Michael, how was it? It was, uh, yeah, it was great. It was really, really good. Like, it genuinely feels fresher, it's thicker, it's just better yeah. Yeah, than almost anywhere else I've had black pudding. Shout out to Diggle's Cafe. Less than four quid for yeah. a full English breakfast, a really good quality English breakfast at that. Shout out to Diggle's Cafe, shout out to Berry Market. Berry Market clearly plays a big part in the local community. Rarely have we seen somewhere so buzzing on a Saturday morning. And less than a mile down the road is another place which is embedded in the history and culture of the town. Gig Lane, the home of Berry Football Club. After the formation of Berry FC and the building of Gig Lane in 1885, football took centre stage, just as it did in almost every other town in the northwest of England. Bury were elected into the Football League in 1894, the same year as Manchester City, and when Manchester United was still known as Newton Heath. In fact, their time in the professional pyramid outdates the likes of Chelsea, Leeds and Tottenham. Within the first 10 years, they'd already won two FA Cups, before Manchester United or Manchester City had won a single piece of silverware. And in 1903, they didn't concede a single goal from the first round all the way to lifting the trophy, a feat that hasn't been achieved since. Now, a century later, things are looking very different. <laughs> well, people always ask you when you go on holiday, so where are you from? And you say Bury, and they go, well, where's that? Well, okay, it's Manchester or Lancashire, etc. But people know who you are for the fact that we've got the um, Bury Markets, Bury Black Pudding, first creators of the police, etc. We have had famous people come from here, Neville Brothers, Danny Boyle. But because it's a small town that's got other small towns around it and then larger football clubs around it, you sort of lose a bit that way. While the likes of United and City continue to grow their international fan bases and thrive financially through huge commercial deals and billionaire investment, other clubs in the Northwest like Oldham, Bolton, Blackpool and Bury have lurched from crisis to crisis. Back in 2001, many clubs in the lower leagues were hit hard by the collapse of ITV Digital, who owned television rights for the Football League. Berry went into administration a year later and would have died completely had the fans not stepped in to save the club. The North West is obviously a, a, a real hotbed of football anyway. You know, you, you're constantly fighting to get the fans in because there's that much competition in such a short, such a small, a small catchment area. With the club in financial difficulty again in 2013, property investor Stuart Day took over. But over the next five and a half years, horrendous debts built up at Gig Lane, meaning that the club had to be sold for a single pound. There were warning signs a lot earlier on than, than what's happened under the current chairman. There was warning signs with the previous chairman. Um, and things could have happened beforehand to make, it, to make it right or to at least give us a helping hand. Um, no bitterness towards any other clubs because they either manage themselves properly and do it right financially, don't overspend or they're maybe 12 to 18 months away from being in the same position to us and I would never wish this on any other football club. The way he came across from what you see from interviews was that he had the best intentions of the club at heart and wanted to grow the club and move it to being championship but then didn't. He, he, he spent money that wasn't that we didn't have or that we didn't need to spend in order to achieve that to achieve that dream and it's come crashing down for us. We have like I said three to four thousand fans and to have a five year plan of of being in the championship and in that time a new stadium holding twenty thousand fans I was like 
This man's deluded. This is where Steve Dale enters the picture. Somebody to buy a club for a pound is a joke, mm. in my opinion. Yeah. You can only get like 10 sweets these days for a pound. I know. But you can buy a ground for, but, uh, and a club for a pound that has got 134 yeah. years of history. I know. Twice yeah. FA Cup winners. One of the first clubs in the country to earn, own floodlights and yeah. play floodlight football. And it was, it was just like it had just gone serious. And you could just tell it weren't a fans club. <laughs> it was like business. But despite saying all the right things when he entered Bury, Dale's ownership soon became a nightmare. Players and staff went unpaid for months with the EFL threatening to cancel games as early as April. Uh, I started there in January 2014 uh, and I got my dismissal letter that said that my contract was terminated from the 4th of July this year. Um, I won't go into it in too much detail because it's subject to legal matters at the moment. I sort of expected it because there was something that was happening within the club from the chairman. It was stuff that he was doing to certain people at the club. Um, I spoke out in a, you know, in a, not in an aggressive way, but in a polite way uh, in front of, in a room with over a hundred people in it. Um, and I, he basically, I think my card was marked from that moment on. So I sort of, I sort of expected it. Some of the stuff that he said with regards to that there's debts that needed to, that needed to be serviced. Yeah, he was right, there was. But the way that it's been done, the not paying of players, the not paying of staff, that's the bit that doesn't sit well with a lot of people. There's people who've been here 30 years that have, have given everything for the, for the club, that's, and that's not people who are involved in the playing side of it. Um, and they've, they've gone without for months. I mean, it, there's two sides to that. There's financial and there's emotional. Um, I mean, I thought I was in a fortunate enough position that I had savings. But for me, it, it was the emotional side of it that, that you've got to manage as best you can. I mean, there's a lady, that, Joan, that's been there for 48 years. Her son, Michael, the groundsman, that's been there for 30 plus. Her daughter, Lynn, who's been there for 30 plus. You know, this, this is their life. So they're not colleagues, they become friends. You become a family and everybody handles it differently so you, you're trying to stay strong for yourself you're trying to stay strong for the fans but you're also looking out for your friends your colleagues um, because some people can't handle it as well as others and ryan law was great he, he would message he'd ring he'd come into the office to speak to all the staff to make sure we were okay it's also got to be said that the fans were utterly incredible you know that a few occasions you know they, they were raising gofundme raising money through GoFundMe, the, the money went to the staff to, to help pay, you know, bills that, that people obviously didn't have money for months on end, so that money was invaluable. And we might only be, compared to the bigger boys, we might only have a small-ish fan base, but they're so loyal and everyone sticks together, you know, the fans, the staff, the players, everybody was in it together and that, we helped each other. And I don't think any of us would have got through it if we weren't there for each other. When you come in and buy a football club, you, you, you buy a football club and you're there to solve the situations and to move it forward. We've not moved forward, we've obviously moved a very long way back. Look, he might think what he's done is the, the, the right thing. I'm not somebody to judge him on what's right or wrong with regards, to, with regards to business. But the fact that we're no longer in the Football League, the fact that we've got a CVA, the fact that the, the, the club's no longer, not been bought by anybody yet means there's something not right that needs resolving quickly. Soon, allegations of asset stripping were rife and with good reason. 43 of the 51 companies Dale had previously been associated with had been liquidated. He was even accused of bullying staff at the club and didn't show himself in the best of light when facing the public. But somehow, manager Ryan Lowe still managed to steer the Shakers to promotion from League Two, with his side outscoring every other team in the division staying true to the club motto of hard work conquers all. Ultimately, the way that the staff handled it with everything, that, not just the players, but all the staff unpaid for four or five months, um, you know, but still going in because we wanted that promotion. We were in such a good position that, that Ryan Lowe, his management team, the players, the supporters, everybody deserved that. And that's why we, you know, we carried on. But come the end of the summer and the unthinkable had happened. On the 27th of August, after five League One games had been suspended and with Steve Dale still unable to sell the club, Berry were expelled from the Football League, becoming the first club to suffer the fate in 27 years. For me, it was certainly a shock because despite what had gone on with the staff and the way that we were treated, you, you still don't think it's ever going to happen to any club, let alone 
let alone yours, you know, the one that you support, the one that you gave everything to. You always think, oh, something will happen, you know, something will, will come out and somebody will buy it. You know, you never hear of a football club going without, without a bidder. Um, but I think there was that much going on behind the scenes that, you know, it was putting a lot of people off. I think it's um, going to be a bit of a wake-up call for people. There will be a club that goes bump where it has to wake everybody up. I honestly thought it'd be a bigger club than us. I did at one point think it would be Bolton, but they somehow managed to get a deal, a deal resolved, which was fine. And I'm very pleased for them because I've got mates who are Bolton fans. There was a club that was going to go bump and it's just unfortunate that it's us. Now the world of football needs to wake up and look at it and go in, are we financing ourselves properly? Because I don't think any other club wants to be the way that this has ended up. To add insult to injury, Dale even proposed that the fans did a whip round to save the club on the eve of the verdict. 150 people lost their jobs and suddenly Berry was without a football club after 134 years. But who is really to blame for what happened to Berry Football Club? Oh, do you know, this, this is one of those that could be debated, already has been and is being debated. Um, it can be, you know, it can go on for years. In my opinion, it comes down to him, Stuart Day, for, to st for starting it all off. Steve Dale for... I'm doing nothing. <laughs> for coming in and screwing it over. It also comes down to, yeah, to a certain extent, the EFL. I know they have rules and stuff like that, and they've got to abide by that, them rules. The EFL have faced a lot of criticism in the wake of the Berry disaster, but have made clear they have been consistent in the way they treat football clubs in financial difficulty, as well as stating they don't have the power to look into the finances of prospective owners before they buy said clubs. The response from many in the football community to this is that this system needs reform. I think that there's, um, I think that there's a multitude of reasons. If you can walk in and buy a football club and then be presented to the EFL and them basically say, oh yeah, this is what we this is who the new owner is before he's taken that, before he's taken that test, and there's something wrong from the EFL side. Um, I'd like to hope that going forward, before somebody buys a club, that they will do those tests accordingly so this doesn't happen again. I think, uh, in a way, when Berry and Bolton was happening, Berry was the smaller team of the two. They could afford to get rid of Berry. Berry was big enough to make a statement, but small enough to go quiet after a few months. Yeah. And that's what I felt. Where if you did that to Bolton, a team that was in the Euro Europa League not too many moons ago, the Premier League, all that stuff, you would have had a big ha -hoo the one thing that most people seem to agree on is that it's a bit of a mixture of the previous chairman Stuart Day and the state he got it into, the current owner um, Steve Dale um, for basically not fulfilling his obligations and promises that he said he'd do when he took it over and, and a bit of the Football League you know for, for their part in it. I'm personally not going to get drawn into whose fault I think it is because none of us are armed with all the facts and I think unless you're armed with all the facts, you can't make a, you know, give a definitive, a definitive answer. So over three months down the line, what has happened and how has the community responded? Almost immediately after they were expelled, a number of fans got together to establish a Phoenix club in order to guarantee that football comes back to Bury if the original club is liquidated. They have amassed over 300 volunteers, all working hard to ensure the project is financially and legally viable. There wasn't, for me, a moment where I thought, right, we had to. Um, I'd been asked by the Supporters Trust just to have a look at what we'd need if we were to do it as a worst case scenario. Um, there was rumblings of a few other people trying it at the same time, and we've sort of come together and looked at it and gone, right, what do we need to do? But it's one of them where you look at it and go, well, if the club's not yet dead, in theory. It's, uh, it's on life support, hopefully. Um, somebody, will buy, somebody who's credible will buy the club and we can go back to watching Berry Football Club rather than, for instance, us all having to go through that hard work of setting up a Phoenix club because this club's died. I, mean, I know what, as much as I'm involved in the Phoenix, yeah. I'd, I'd love to be able to come and watch a Berry Football Club team play here week in, week out, rather than it be a case of us starting off as, for instance, lower echelons of football completely somewhere else, even though we know we'd need to. It's all volunteers and it's all fans. If this club doesn't get bought and it gets liquidated, then the Phoenix Club is going to be their club. Um, you'll get those people who, who don't want to be involved with it to begin with, and it'll take a bit of time with them. 
But so far we've had, I think it's over 1,300 responses to this survey where people have told us if gig is the main priority for them, what they would like to see the structure of the club be, are they happy for it to be done by just external investors or do they want us to be 51, 49 in favour of the fans owing it? We've had a, uh, a lot of good help really. Um, we've dealt with FC United, uh, Chester, Wrexham, uh, Wimbledon as well we've been, we've been dealing with recently. Um, they've been very, very helpful. That and the, the Football Supporters Association. I, I love the fact that there's, a, that there's a, basically a bike training centre here. <laughs> Brilliant. No, we've, we've done a lot of stuff with FC United. A few of the volunteers went down to watch an FC game a couple of weeks ago. They, they were able to grill them for a couple of hours and find out what they'd put into it. It's just a case of trying to keep the momentum going until we know exactly what's happening. If we need to walk away because of the fact that there's, there's owners in place who are going to move the actual club itself forward, then that's fine. If that doesn't happen, we've got to be ready to obviously have a club playing in 2020. As well as these plans for a Phoenix club, fans have also responded more directly to the emotional and financial impact of Bury FC's disappearance. Putting on social events at pubs local to Gig Lane so supporters can catch up as they would have done on match days and raise revenue for the establishments which are suffering hard as a result of the expulsion. Me and John just got together outside the club when we knew the dark days were coming, you know, and, and we just said, like, you know, where do you drink, where do I drink? We've got to keep everyone together. On a match day in here, that room was full. In here was full. This bar was full with a fridge. Outside was full. Debbie behind the bar, she was saying they could have shut down. That was it, you know. Yeah. Six months, she said. Yeah, to me. I'll give it that. And this yeah. has brought her fresh hope. Try our best for the yeah, fans, don't that's we? It. it gives them Keep a bit us. of money, put, put some money in their coffers. Yeah. Like, you did think about, oh, what am I going to do? Mm. But then you also, quit, I think, quickly you, you thought, what about the Stanley Club? What about the Rose and Crown? What about the staff of life? We're we know football. we're, we we're, know we're not going to have any football. Yeah. Um, what can we do? So we, we came up with the idea of every four weeks with a week off so you can give your liver a break. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, it's just to, just to try and share a bit yeah. of money money around. And it's been good. It's and been it nice. And, and I think Debbie, Debbie, speaking to Debbie, she she very much appreciates it. Yeah. Like, I remember the first one we had here, she earned, earned about five, six hundred quid. And she said, that'll pay towards some bills. In fact, the Rose and Crown as yeah. well, when we had that one. We had more people in that weekend and we made more money than the match day. And while we were in the area, a very special event was taking place in Manchester. We Are Bury, an exhibition containing hundreds of pieces of historic club memorabilia collected from fans by lifelong supporter Zoe Hitchin. What's happened to Bury could happen to any club and we want to make sure that we're telling the fans' stories, which are so important. Every football fan wants to win every week, wants to win silverware, and that's fine. But then when your club dies, you suddenly realise what is important. We understand the cost of everything, but we've almost like lost the value of everything within football. And it's only when something like this happens that you suddenly realise the significance of like capturing a moment in time. Because it's like having a member of the family that perhaps when they pass, you think, I wish I'd spent more time with them. I wish that I'd taken more pictures, I wish that I'd spent longer with them and probably say anything at the moment, it's really treasure what you've got right now with your football club. Particularly because when I was younger I went with my friends, I got introduced to football through friends, not family, and I loved going to the football and it built my confidence up actually because I was really shy when I was younger. All of those people are so valuable and important to me and again because that's now just stopped you suddenly go wow this means so much more to me than I ever realised. Football is a reflection of society, the zeitgeist, it's part of the zeitgeist. If you look at any of these things you can see what was happening at the time. You know when the war, when the war was going on, you can see it, there's a reflection. You can see what's happening in our world now, especially in the UK right here in front of us but I don't want this to be the end I want this to be look at what we've got don't stop if we have to go and start from the bottom again but it's fan driven 
Oh, imagine, it's going to feel amazing. And, I, and I'll feel really, I want to be part of that. I'm going to feel really proud of where I'm from. And this sentiment is reflected by many in the fan base. With no club to support this season, certainty over the future of football in Bury is understandably the top priority for many. And with the clock ticking, some even see the Phoenix Club as the only way forward, whatever the cost. I don't like to say it, but I want my club liquidated. Honestly, I, I hate to say it. I, I, you, you know, yeah. I don't know who you support, but I, you do not want your club liquidated. But the way forward for us and to get him out as a crook, we have to go down that route yeah. and start the Phoenix. But since we visited Bury towards the end of 2019, a lot has happened. In December, yet another winding up order to liquidate the club was dismissed in court and a consortium backed by the club supporters Trust Forever Berry revealed their plan to buy the club. We caught up with Chris to try and make sense of what's going on. It's been, what, a couple of months? Been a couple of months since we last spoke properly. Yeah. Can I fill me in what, on what's happened since then? We applied to North West Counties League. Um, we've registered with the Manchester FA. We've got a name of the club now, uh, which we've got all the fans to vote on, which is great. So uh, the winning choice on that was Berry AFC. We've also been made aware of a gentleman called Rob Benwell, who's looking to buy the ground uh, if the club's liquidated. I think at first, I think people didn't realise that Rob's plan was to do it post-liquidation. What Rob is looking to try and do is create another club playing at game lane, same as what we're trying to do. As part of this, there's been this consortium, right, which is, is proposing to uh, buy Berry FC. How, how much do you and other kind of fans know about that process? Not very much, to be fair. Um, we were made aware of it because the consortium Fair Play to them reached out to Forever Berry. And I was then made aware of it through Forever Berry because they had a meeting scheduled with Rob Benwell, but then they wanted to bring the consortium together. We were aware of it, but we're not entirely too sure as to how far down the line they are. 99% of the fans are wanting it to be a case of that uh, the club is saved by the consortium in its original state as Berry FC. But it's obviously time dependent as mm. to how it works because they have to put their application in to the FA by a certain date, etc. And there's different things that they've got to go through. But obviously then as well, Steve Dale's got to play ball with them, but they're also racing against the clock a little bit with regards to the CBA that Berry have against them. Um, I think the fan base is a little bit split at the moment with it. And I think it's just a case of because people have opinions, they're always going to be different opinions that we just let things take its course. If the club's going to be saved by the consortium, it'll be saved by the consortium. If it isn't, then there's a football team pretty much ready to go that's been created by us and obviously whatever Rob decides to do his way as well. So there we have it, almost six months on from Berry's expulsion from the Football League and there are still so many questions about the future of football in the town. The Shakers fan base has remained resilient and even optimistic this season as we have seen in the brilliant initiative set up by John, Simon and Zoe which have breathed life into a community broken by the actions of Steve Dale and those before him. And along with the work being done by the Phoenix Club to ensure that football definitely will be in Bury next season, they are writing the next chapter in the club's history which could so easily have ended in August 2019. This, nevertheless, is a situation nobody wanted to be in. Pubs should have never faced closure, 150 people shouldn't have lost their jobs, and nobody should be hoping that the club they support gets liquidated. But that is the reality when a football club is taken away from the people who love it the most. And while the story of Berry FC serves as a warning, this could only be the start. Bolton, of course, came worryingly close to suffering a similar fate to the Shakers, while Macclesfield Town have had points deducted and even had players go on strike over unpaid wages this season. With the gap between rich and poor growing ever wider in English football and clubs still open to exploitation, it may be only a matter of time until we see another story like Berry. As always, thanks to absolutely everyone who helped. There was a mass of people who made this what it is. And yeah, thanks for everyone. I could go through the list, but we'll be here for ages. Um, if you did enjoy this, make sure you dropped it a like, subscribe to the channel, because you know the more love you give this, the more we can do them. Um, anything else, Michael? Yeah, uh, if you enjoyed this, obviously, go and check out the other journeyman mm. that we have done on Forest Green Rovers and Notts County. And I guess we'll see you next time.